Hey Donna, hey folks at ARS, uh, it's Mark from Tri Gable Lee Farm. I wanted to g give you something, I wanted to give you something. Um, this going back to school thing, it, this feels like a, like a vlog or like a, like a diary entry. Uh, <laughs> Star date, September 23rd. Uh, the crew is not doing well. <laughs> um, yeah, it's like, I, you know, I put on my smile every day, just like everybody else. Um, I wear it for my kids. I wear it for my wife. I wear it for the students that I teach and my coworkers. But like on the inside, we're not we're not doing so well. Um, so I'm making this just for you guys. Um, I don't know how long this is going to be. I I'm looking at the clock. It's like nine o'clock. I, I know I got to go to bed, but I, I wanted to give you guys something, um, you know, it's free, you know. You're you're not paying the primo price for me to come out and do anything. So so, um, and I'm winging it. I'm not prepared. <laughs> so, the the whole m me going back teaching, my wife teaching, and the kids being in there, it's it's crazy. It's hard to find any time to breathe. So enough said. You get it. Okay. So bees, bees in the winter. Um. Okay, with your top bar highs. Right now, we're we're hitting that like fall flow time. It's always hit or miss every year. Right now, we got a bit of a drought. Mm, it's not looking so good as far as like what they they can be bringing in. Now every area is different. Um, that's to say that like, despite drought, it, like you still may have like a good flow. It's not all just dependent on rain and weather and stuff like that, but it can be. Just because you see lots of flowers out and about, it's flying here. Just, just because you see um, flowers out and about, the golden rods crazy out there. The the um, invasive um, weed, Japanese knotweed that's on the side of the roads. It grows like crazy and it has white flowers. That's actually like a really good source of nectar. So here's the thing, though, is that they're not going to pump out as much nectar in the flowers when you're in a time of drought. So the, the, the flowers will bloom. The bees will still be going there like crazy. They'll pollinate. That job will get done, but they'll get less nectar. All right, so and all those little drops of nectar, you know, add up to their winter stores. So so right now, it's it's totally okay to do supplemental feeding. So, uh <laughs> All right, so like this is where we start to get into like, you know, at what times of the year do you kind of change the, your foods that you're going to be using and feeding feeding the hive? So yes, offer them right now. Go ahead, offer them one-to-one -one syrup. Have it in there all the time. Keep refreshing and adding it in both of the hives. Um, make it super easy for them to get like, well, you do have it super easy for them to get. Never mind, I know your setup. Um, <laughs> so, um yeah, yeah, you, you just want, like, two jars in there, fine, if you got the room for it. Um, I think we did that mid-season shift the last time I was there. We shifted all the bars down to one side. Um, we're not at the point where we want to condense down the size of the colony yet and the space that they have. Um, that's going to be a little later on. Um, so we did have our first frost. I don't know if you guys did. You likely did. We had our first frost this week. Took me by surprise. First, it wasn't a first killing frost. It didn't kill like all of the, the flowers and everything. That's bad when, when we get that. And that tends to happen like mid-October. But to have a frost already, that's still early. I'm certain that it did kill some blooms that were out there. Um, some of the, so that it's automatically going to cut off some of the food sources. So feed, 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 feed. Okay. Now, um, remember, I'm your mentor and, and I don't treat my bees for anything. I don't add pollen patties. The one thing I'll do is feed sugar syrup and stuff like that. If you guys are inclined to treat for mites and stuff, like you've got to do the research on your own. I think I made that clear way back when. Um, it's not something that I can mm, mentor you in because it's not something that I do. So I know nothing about it. And and that's I'm honest with you about that. Um, so mite loads in the fall tend to be heavier. Okay, and so you tend to start to lose some bees. So anything you can do to like just monitor and try and try and like give them that food, um, and see make sure the populations are big. So 
if, if, like there's a worst case scenario. If you thought that like one colony just really wasn't going to make it for the winter, then what you could consider doing is, is combining both hives into one stronger colony population wise. Now that's tricky business. Okay. And this, this is where I don't even think my book gets into it. No, I don't think so. But, um, there are resources out there for top four hives. I have none of them because I'm not prepared. You probably own one of the books already. You'd flip through the table of content, the, the glossary, and you'd look for combining hives in a top bar hive, not other hives, in a top bar hive. I feel, it's late, man, what's his name? I feel like Christy Hemingway's book has it in there, The Thinking Beekeeper, and I feel like that fella from England, Balanced Beekeeping. I feel, I feel like um, his book totally has it in there. To describe the process, let's so let's say worst case is like you're getting into October, which is around the corner, and you know that those killing frosts are coming around, and you're like, we we want to stop manipulating the hive, you know, when we get those killing frosts, when it gets to, when the nights get cold. So, if you had a, one colony that just didn't look like it was going to make it, or two, whatever, <laughs> um, the process would be one where remember that each queen has its own set of pheromones. So you're going to use that follower board in joining the hives. You would you would choose a colony and say which queen are we going to kill, and and you know pinch her whatever you'd find her, and you'd kill her. Okay, <laughs> you know you so now you this makes it tricky because you have one hive which seemed to be the stronger hive. Don't know if that's still the same case. The one with the cross comb had a marked queen in her, and that'd kind of be easy to find. Although she might be buried in that weird cross comb stuff. All right, and we're probably still deciding to leave that over winter. Now the other one, the marked queen is gone because they requeen themselves. So find it. You gotta. If you were to do this, your best bet at finding the queen would be the first look in <laughs> the weird cross combed hive. And if you don't find her in those in those combs that are like nice that you can inspect, then your next bet is to is to, is to look for the queen in the other hive. Now again, probably nine times out of ten, a beginner beekeeper is not going to be combining hives. I'm I'm saying like worst case, you really do. You guys looked at the at both hives. You did an inspection this week, and you both like you felt that one of them just wasn't really picking up and storing enough okay uh like a failure to thrive thing or was even contracting in population that's not good we want to see an increase in population as they go into winter because the bees that are born in like october even in a, even a little bit now they are the ones whose wings do not get tattered over the winter because they don't get used that much and they survive in that cluster over the whole winter um and then they start flying again and foraging and eventually their wings get tattered in the springtime foraging and they die. All right. But because their main cause of death is not being able to fly back to the hive, um, they, they are, you know, they likely survive the winter. Now that's not to say that you won't have losses of relatively healthy bees in the winter. Some that might be on the outside of the cluster. Let's not get to that. Um, let's come back to the, what would you do if you were to combine them? So you might have to look in that hive that has the unmarked queen and find ooh, really dig in your skills of, of observation and find that unmarked queen. So if you did find her and you were committing to joining them together, pincher. Okay? You pinch her. And you'd start to get both hives set up for a transfer. You would want to make enough room in the, the hive that you're going to keep for the best resources from the other hive. Now that's not not just going to be the the nectar and the brood that's there. It might be like really nice comb that they can still can store stuff in, um, the fullest combs and stuff like that. And um, and of course all those bees, all those bodies of bees. You really don't want to like leave many behind. You want it, you want when you transfer, you want as many bees to be on those combs, gently bringing them over. Now. 
the bees in the two hives still smell like different queens. So the follower board that go that divider board that goes between them that is going to be in the your keeper hive. That one you've got to seal up really good. Now I know you got some good engineers who can really think through things and practice and 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 engineer things the typical way. Like if we have box hives that were stacked on one another, the typical way of combining the bees would be to take all the boxes that you're gonna put on top of the other one. And in between them, put some newspaper in between. And the newspaper acts as a time release capsule. All right, as that outer coating of the, you know, as they chew their way through the newsprint, you know, a few she sheets of newsprint, it gives them time to get used to each other's pheromones. So they don't attack and kill one another because they smell like they're like an invader from another hive. <coughs> Remember, there's only one queen that's alive at this point, and the newbies are getting used to it. Now, in a horizontal hive, you're going to try and mimic that. So with the follower, what have I done? I've gotten a tight fit with the follower on the keeper bees. I've gotten extra bars out, made as much room, even extra combs that didn't make sense. I counted out how many bars of room I would need and then gave it even one more extra and have room for that follower too. And I used, I used newsprint. I tore out some strips of newsprint and laid it in and laid it in and laid it in and then kind of set down the follower in that newsprint. Now being careful to also check at the tops that there aren't like weird little gaps and stuff like that where the bees can get from one to another. It's a lot, ain't it? It's a lot, ain't it? So entrance, so let's say then you move the other bees over, you get it all sealed up on the top. Now entrances, okay. Do you want the new bees or used to the other hive flying out? No. Because they're going to fly out and find out that they're in their old home. They're just going to go right back to their old home and there isn't any stuff there. You would actually at that point want to completely remove from the field that other hive. The, uh, the hive that's not going to be used. And in the area on the side where the new bees are, you're going to want to... They need ventilation, but you don't want them flying yet. So you're going to want to pull a cork and then quickly put on some screening, some household screening from an old crummy screen or whatever. I'm sure you guys can figure that out. Something that they can't chew through with their mandibles. Okay, so typically like a metal screen. Staple it on. And what I would do is I would leave the two colonies separated for like three days. Ish. That's ballpark. Is this exactly what you should do? Mm. It's about ballpark for them to get used to each other's scents. All right. So remember, the follower doesn't have any gaps. There's no hole in the follower. You're not feeding sugar and stuff like that. This is worst case scenario. You're abandoning ship on feeding for a few days in order to get this giant mass of bees to work together to survive as one colony. So if I was able to come out and do an inspection, I'd probably be able to make like a quick call. If you wanted to like inspect and do a little video of one hive and a little video of the other, send them to me. I'd be glad to watch the videos. Um, I think I've just kind of like driven home that like my daytime hours of, of being able to, to do stuff, it's hard to commit. It's hard to commit. Um, okay. <sighs> Stay in focus, Goskowitz. <laughs> I'm, I'm basically talking to myself because I see, I see, I see myself. That's where my eye contact is. All right, so let's now abandon, oh, so what would you do finally to let them, so then what I would do is I take the cork out of the follower and I'd see their behavior. I'd open, I, I would see, I would take the cork out of the follower, put the follower back in place after the three days. And I'd drop that window and I'd just see if I see bees fighting one another, like literally trying to rip each other apart tear and get each other out of the hive and stuff like that and, and drag bodies away okay if i wasn't seeing that good okay Me, like not immediately but i just leave that hole open and then probably the next day pff, follower board's gone just you know maybe it's only there to shift things over and then to do feeding and stuff like that um but that then we're considering them one colony and the bees are going to go where they need um if if that is the case, I would then also at that point rearrange combs. I would take any combs that had brood 
and find where the old brood was in the original in the keeper hive and take brood and put with brood just honey with just honey empty comb with just comb okay so and now you're trying to like help them manage it they'll figure it out now that they don't have like the queen confusion in there all right enough said this is like i go on that whole tangent and I, because I didn't plan for it, I probably would have saved it for the end. Let's get into the stuff that you still need to know. <sighs> Timestamp, man. <laughs> How far in on this? Why, like 20 something minutes. All right. It's okay. It's okay. So, okay. October's coming. What does October typically look like? Remember propolis. Propolis is what they put to mm, fill up the air gaps in between things. Now, propolis is only really kind of mushy and pliable in warm temperatures. Now they keep it warm inside the hive, but as things cool down outside, the propolis becomes hard and brittle and cracks. And what that means is that every time you inspect and when it's hard and brittle and it cracks, it creates air holes that might not ever get sealed up. Now likely they will, but you might like let's say it's like November and you're doing some sort of inspection, you cracked open every single bar, pop, 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 no pop, because it's not like summer when they're kind of like gooey and they'll pull apart. They'll they're brittle and they pop apart one bar and another because of that propolis seal. Um, that it's not likely to be able to seal back up. All right, so we don't go messing around with doing big full inspections in the cold months. We hold off on that. That's why you've got your observation window to take a peek in. That's where you can put your hands on top of the bars and you can feel where the warmth is. You can feel where cold is, where no bees are, and you can feel where there's a clump of bees. So never mind seeing them, you'll, you'll also have that. Uh, so you're gonna wanna avoid that. Right now you can still do that. Right now you can still pop through them. But in a couple weeks I wouldn't. Mid-October I, I wouldn't, I, I'd be hunkering down, just feeding just offering them feed and I offer feed all the way through like probably December. Do they take it then? No, but I offer, I offer feed. So here's the thing is that once the temperatures, once you've got, if we give benchmarks, once you kind of get to your first frost and those bees are unlike your first killing frost, mid October ish for me might be earlier for you. Um, and those bees can't get nectar anymore from the stuff that's out there in the fields. The flowers are dead, killed, okay? That's when I switch over to a two to one syrup. Now a two to one syrup means two parts sugar, two pounds of sugar for every one pound of water. All right, so up until this point, you've been feeding one to one syrup and the benchmark you can keep in your head is first frost. Okay, when you, you get that first killing frost, switch over to two to one syrup. Now that's gonna be a thicker syrup it's going to be a little harder to you know to get everything to dissolve. You may need to make sure that um, that the sugar crystals dissolve, and that when you shake that thing and you let everything settle in the jar, that you don't see sugar crystals. Because when you flip the jar over, those crystals will then be on the bottom where the holes are. And you are scientifically mind people. <laughs> if you seed a highly concentrated solution that wants to crystallize with crystals, what happens? You get you, you you get all of that formation it's like breaking bad no it's not okay <laughs> jesse okay um <laughs> i just rewatched breaking bad okay what else we got oh, um so you need to make sure those crystals are dissolved and fondant when fondant or hard candy I, I would go ahead and do yourself a favor and now or anytime now when you got some time nobody's got time but find the time to just take those feeding frames in your winterizing kit they have the wire mesh in them those feeding frames and if you can pour up a hard candy pour up a hard candy that's going to be my my go-to to you is to say don't do fondant do hard candy if you can learn learn how to make hard candy Man, I should do a video on that, but yeah, okay, maybe it's in that little book. I kind of outline my and have pictures and stuff like that on how I do it. Um, and so 
those hard candy frames, you're going to want to get them in around that first, first frost time when you're transitioning over. So yes, you're feeding, but you're also looking at, this is where I'd get a pencil out when I do inspections, and I'd label on top of the bars. B, brood, 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 mm, eggs, E, mm, okay, eggs and brood, ooh, honey at the top, or all honey on the, when you're looking at each comb. When you get to the ones that are all honey, those are going to be your their reserves, and you may or may not have a lot right now. That's why you're switching to two-to-one syrup, because it is more concentrated, and it's easier for them to take that two-to-one syrup, put it in a cell, and it's they have to evaporate it less. Think about it. There's half as much water, sugar to water. Yeah, there's half as much on my brain. There's half as much water in there, so there's half as much work for them to do. I don't know if that math is right, you know, assuming that it's not based on a square or a cube or anything like that. It's a surface area, so it's probably based on a square. Um, so, so they're going to have to evaporate it down put less work to evaporate it down to turn it into honey that they can cap and they can store over winter. That's why you switched over that. Sorry that this is why you're just going to watch from beginning to end. So you get all of these little things and you take notes. Now back to the candy, the hard candy or fondant that is made at a ratio of four parts sugar to one part water, which is the same ratio that honey is honey. That's been reduced down is at a ratio of four parts sugar to one part water. That's why it's so thick, viscous, okay? Sticky, viscous, just tossing out fun words at this point. Um, mm, so fond that's why fondant and hard candy are basically equivalent as a food source. However, fondant tends to be a little mushy when it gets into high humidity. Can you use fondant in the hive on that feeding frame? Yes, but you're putting it in a high humidity environment and it is likely that some of that is going to slick off and go into the bottom of the hive. Is that bad? It's not the end of the world. You basically just like have fondant down at the bottom. It's not bad for the bees, but it's not good for the bees. Because here's the thing is that bees in the winter, they cluster up at the top of the bars. Okay. They form a sphere that goes over several combs and they form a sphere. Think of penguins in the Arctic where the penguins on the outside, they get the coldest, but the warmest penguins move their way to the outside and heat those penguins up and they get warmer and warmer on the inside as they move to the inside and then they become an outside penguin. The same thing happens with the honeybees. They cluster up and the bees on the outside edge, man, I hope all this pulls together. The bees on the outside edge uh, of that sphere that is across multiple combs, so it's a weird sphere, um, the bees on the outside edge, they kind of go into this like dormant stupor because they're like cold blooded. I don't know. They're, they're, are they cold blooded? Whatever. They, the, they go, they shut down. They shut down. They don't move until enough warm bees move from the center and they're like, thanks for helping us. They go to the outside and they vibrate their wings because they're still warm and they're still alive and they're not dead and the ones on the inside vibrate their wings and how are they getting that energy from the stored honey that you they left in there and from the stored extra sugars that are emergency candies that that you put in there and where are they going to find it they're going to find it up at the top uh, now th so this is why it's important you're looking at the honeycombs that are in there and you're making a judgment hmm this one here at the end it's got some honey in it, but not really a lot. So you're going to move that over. And you're going to put your, your spare feed, your emergency feed, after the last top bar of decent honey. And maybe you put in a second feeding frame, because I gave you two per, for each hive. I mean, I gave you, you paid for two for each hive. I would put in both. Why not just, why one, put in both. Now, you're some... Some other little details. When you pour the candy, some of the candy may get stuck at the top of the bar and might not make a nice seal bar to bar and stuff like that. So do your best to flip the bars around, blah, 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 and make it so that when you, the bees are eating and consuming honey from the last honeycomb that has honey in it and they are balled up, they're getting that, 
and now they need to shift over just shift over just a little bit to get that neck that emergency candy that's there if there is an empty bar, bar of wax there they will not go across that empty bar of wax to get to your emergency feed they want to go from full one to full one to full one to full one to full one hope i'm driving this home the importance that they will starve to death if you leave an empty honeycomb in between the emergency feed your candy and the honey comb the last honeycomb that has honey in it they will not leave that cluster to go get any syrup they won't okay so we're driving home some serious things some some important stuff where are we okay so walking through November. so when do you want to have those uh, my brain shut now. When do you want to have those uh, the candy bars in? You want to have them in by that time of that first frost, by the time you're switching over two to one syrup. Okay, It'll still be warm enough for them to crawl under those bars, get to the two to one syrup that's on the other side of the candy. Go back and store it. But you want to have it in there so that when the cold temperatures really do hit and they cluster up, that that emergency feed is there. So general rule is in the winter, if you if you feel the cluster and it feels like they are in the emergency feed area, that means that it's probably time for you to maybe consider, consider getting more emergency feed. Because if they're in their emergency feed and it's the end of winter, um, so th this would typically happen like March or something like that. Um, bees starve to death in March and April because there's no flowers around yet no significant flowers and they are producing bees producing bees producing bees and maybe we just save this for like another video later i don't think i need to get into this now you guys request a video on like spring or or a visit or something like that and for how to take them out of winter okay let's do so what we're focusing on now if we keep our focus is going into the fall and into the winter your preparations so you've already got your hives anchored. Awesome. I'd say, let's see. Do you need to strap anything? Okay. So you're going to be adding on mouse guards. You're going to be reducing everything down to one entrance. When can you do that? You can do that pretty much now if you wanted to. All right. You can reduce it down to one cork. When can you put the mouse guards on? by the time you get that first frost. Because what's gonna happen is when it gets cold enough that you have first frost, those bees go up uh, at night and they don't guard the entrance. Okay, They're not clustering, but they just don't guard the entrance, which means bees, uh, bees. Um, uh, mice, mice that might wanna come in around that first frost time to make a nice little winter home they uh they might start making their winter home there so we've got a lot of benchmarks in the next couple weeks um mouse guards feed jar you anchored them in case you get strong winds and stuff like that go ahead and do crazy anchoring if you got hurricane winds coming you go ahead and you do something crazy you strap on the top you you do crazy anchors all over the place go for it now for each of those hives, you're, you're going to also want to insulate the window, get that little strip of insulation cut nice and neat. Um, you, can, you can put that on now if you wanted to. There's no harm in insulating early, okay? There's no harm in putting the insulation on top, that rigid insulation that you have, the big blue insulation, put that on top of the hive now. Now why could you use other insulations? Yeah, I'd stick with the rigid though, because the, so let's say you use the, fiberglass perfectly fine but you have to have it like cut precisely so that it doesn't touch the walls because what uh, the walls of the roof because what will happen is little bits of moisture that gets wind driven into that roof will catch onto the fiberglass and wick its way in and you can have a big soggy thing of fiberglass insulation and you know that that's not going to insulate because you're smart people i'm just going to keep driving this home you're smart people um you get how insulation works and so uh that's why i choose rigid that's why i do not like uh towel over the top that's why i don't use straw or hay 
because they tend unless so when could or would you use straw or hay or any of those others if you were wicked smart people and you caulked every little inside crack of that roof and you made that roof truly weathertight now the way i gave it to you was not truly weathertight i guess my bad what you know i build them the way they are and i don't go making them crazy weathertight you're smart people and if you want to caulk them then you could Go crazy insulating that roof. You guys can 3D print <laughs> a precise fitting uh, <laughs> roof. I guess it'd be a, pentago a penta pentagonal prism, pentagonal prism, you know, uh, so it fits the roof space. All right. Ugh, now I'm just getting silly. Um, what do we got? Insulation. Oh, the last thing you've got is the roofing paper, that black roll of roofing paper. Now, why is that added? That is mostly added as a windbreak. Okay, so that does not need to be wrapped around the whole hive and, and everything. And especially at the bottom, if you were to take that and wrap it around the whole hive, you know, like a hot, like a hot dog, like a burrito, like a whatever you wrap things around. I don't know, like a baby, like a pig in a blanket. All right, so if you were to wrap it all the way around, I hope you're enjoying this. Um, what would happen is is water would get in and settle in the bottom crease. It'd be a little weird. You, you, you might be introducing water up through the bottom of the hive and stuff like that. It's a little weird. Um, so what I do is I kind of do, um, I start on, you know where the handle is, the handle on the roof, okay? I staple it there, okay, so it kind of folds over the handle, and I get get it stapled there, so that it kind of creates a little drip edge, okay, and then I, I flip it up and over, over the entrances, dude, there's pictures of this in the book, I don't, look, look in my digital book, yeah, look in my digital book, I flip it up and over, and, and then I basically end up stapling it to the window um frame so so okay so i get like a carpet stapler boom 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 the bees don't necessarily like this all right so to have you banging on their on their hive stapling things in or whatever um and then you got to cut some like little x's and like make it so that the the one entrance hole they can still fly in and out and there's not going to be any confusion if anything maybe just cut a big old actually in my book i show the x's but what i've really done is i cut a big old hole now probably about four or five inches around so that nothing no water moisture that there's plenty of airflow in and out of that entrance okay you might read about moisture being a problem in overwintering beehives moisture tends to be a problem in vertical hives but not horizontal hives because the physics of moist air is that it's actually less dense than dry air so moist air rises to the top of a tall hive hits a cold roof and then condenses into liquid water and then drips on the bees and then freezes on the bees and they die. Now in a horizontal top bar hive, you've got convection currents and stuff that are still going around in the entrance and everything. And you don't have that big, that big pocket of, of warm, moist air. It's a little more around the cluster and spread out. It, it, it's hunkered around that cluster. I think we're there. I think we're there with the big things. Okay. I'll end it like I end all my classes. I love you. Because we all need a little love in the world. Bye, guys. Take care. And stop recording.